So we don't have any questions via the chat, but we can we can open it up inshallah. If anybody has a question, please feel free to unmute and ask live. And these questions can be either for about something that we mentioned today or something that you have seen in the uh, video files that you have uh, watched online. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salman, how are you? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Barakallah khair for this course. Uh, one thing I need to, uh, where I need a, a little bit of clarification is that, I mean, we have studied Seerah, we have studied the uh, the revelation of the Quran, but you are combining, there is a way that where you are actually knitting them, the two together. So if, if you can just talk about a little bit of how, what, what your methodology and linking that to <clears throat> sure uh, the uh, but just like a very valid question and exactly this is actually the difference between this uh, series of meetings and what is already posted online as the narration of the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or what you may read in a book about the narration of the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we are trying to understand the quran from the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so interweaving them together because i believe that the best interpretation of the Quran is to know in what condition were these ayat revealed, what were they responding to, what were they addressing, what was the response of the Prophet ﷺ and the people around him, whether they were believers or non-believers or hypocrites or family of the scripture, what were the different responses and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought these to the faith. Some of them accepted and some of them rejected. So the methodology of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in addressing all of their accusations and all of their allegations is exactly the same thing that we are facing today. So if we learn how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed all of these accusations, that would be, I believe, the best way to respond to these same accusations that we are facing today. I hope that answers your question. Yes, Jazakallah khairan. So inshallah, are you going to do uh, it like a chronologically or how are you going to proceed? Uh, Mostly it's going to be, we're going to try to follow it chronologically as, as far as we can or as much as we can. But from time to time, we would jump from one spot to another to show the interrelationship among the sower themselves. Because the sower are a very beautiful continuum. Some of the scholars of Quran, by the way, say that the Quran is all one solid surah or one solid ayah from beginning to end because it's so interconnected. And that's why even when you look at some of the sower, you're gonna find in the order of the revelation, you're gonna find uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam receiving a certain passage of the Quran and then later on receiving other ayat and telling his companions who used to write uh, or what he dictated them, he used to tell them, put this ayah in such and such location between this ayah and the other one. So the Quran, as we know, was not revealed uh, chronologically as we read it today in the Mus'haf. But we're trying to understand the original chronology of the Qur'an in its revelation and how it addressed specific events and why was it revealed at that time and what's the significance of that revelation at that time. Allah. In fact, in, in one way we are trying to do what Ali radiallahu did to okay. compile the Qur'an in the, in the order of revelation. Well, uh, the, the order of the Qur'an, as the, the scholars of Qur'an say, is tawqifi, which means it's a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu, first of all, the Qur'an was collected at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And then it was bound together at the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The major attempt to collect it together was at the time of the, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and then Sayyidina Umar confirmed that. And then when the Islamic conquests were so uh, great in the time of Sayyidina Umar and many tribes from different countries came to Islam with different dialects and accents and so on, Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu wanted to unify their recitation of the Quran according to the major languages of Quraysh. So he instructed the scribes to write the Qur'an primarily in the different dialects of Quraysh, primarily because that's where the Qur'an was revealed, and not the Persians or the Egyptians or the Moroccans or some people from somewhere else. And that order is that we use today in the Mus'haf, 
That's why it's called Mus'haf Uthman, by the way. So uh, that, that is the order in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant the Quran to be. So again, there is a significance in the order of revelation, definitely. And there is a significance in the final shape of the Quran as we have it today. But when we recite the Quran in order, if we want to do it according to the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, it is in the same order that we have it today in the Mus'haf that we have in our hands. All right, Okay, I'm, I'm gonna uh, keep talking to refresh your memories and maybe that's going to uh, start a new line of questioning, bidnillah. Uh, some of the differences between uh, the words in the Quran. So, for example, we find the word rih in the Quran. And we found the word riyah. Riyah means wind, and riyah means winds. What's the difference between the two? Can we use these two words interchangeably? Well, no. Every individual letter in the Quran has a certain significance. So, wa is different from fa, fa is different from thumma, and so on. So, what's the difference, for example, between riyah and riyah? If we look in the Quran, we're going to find always the word riyah comes in the context of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the winds carry the glad tidings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas the word riyah, which is the single or the singular of riyah, comes always in the context of punishment. Uh, the only exception is uh, so what they saw or what they thought was good winds that are carrying their, the sails of their ships and pushing them forward, it was followed by a storm that destroyed these ships. So that's one difference, for example, between the word rih and riyah. So when you listen to it in the Quran, again, try to understand the concept. Rih is bad, riyah is good. Another difference in the Quran, again, I'm going to keep talking until you tell me to stop if you have a question. Uh, one other difference is between وَمَا أَدْرَاكْ and وَمَا يُدْرِيكْ. So, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ And then in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ السَّاعَةَ تَكُونُ قَرِيبًا so what's the difference between وَمَا أَدْرَاكْ and وَمَا يُدْرِيكْ? They come from the same source, Dara, which means knew about something. In مَا أَدْرَاكْ, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling, asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and what do you know about such and such? And then following that question comes the answer. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرِ Whereas, وَمَا يُدْرِيكْ we find what do you know if the day of judgment might be so close? You don't know when the day of judgment is going to be. So again, when you hear the word وَمَا أَدْرَاكْ in the Quran, recognize that the answer is immediately following that question. But if you hear وَمَا يُدْرِيكْ, the answer is hidden only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would know it. I can see some questions on the chat. Yes, we, we have one question. Um, we have a couple. The first one is, what is the significance of Surat Al-Alaq to, to the Muslim Ummah? Jazakumullah uh, khayran. Surat Al-Alaq starts with a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Which is Iqra. Some people mistakenly think, mistakenly think, that since the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was illiterate, that illiteracy is a virtue. It is not. Illiterate, illiteracy is a defect, except in the case of the Prophet ﷺ. In the case of the Prophet ﷺ, it was a miracle to show Quraysh that this illiterate man who could not read or write is the one who, to whom this Quran was revealed, so he could not have composed it by himself or written it by himself. But to any other human, illiteracy would be a defect. 
Some people today, they claim, for example, uh, according to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, نَحْنُ أُمَّةٌ أُمِّيَّةٌ We are an illiterate people. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not bragging about that because there is nothing to brag about in being illiterate. He was stating a fact. When we look at, if we, now we're going to jump forward a few years, when we look at after the, the Battle of Badr, when the believers had many prisoners of war from the non-believers, one condition for setting these prisoners free is for each one of them to teach 10 Muslims how to read and write. Therefore, if illiteracy was a virtue by itself, the Prophet ﷺ would not have insisted on that. And it was actually the opposite. The Prophet ﷺ cared about every believer to be able to read, knowing that reading is the source of acquiring knowledge. So especially nowadays when we have books so abundant around us, it's not as easy to attend a, a dars in the masjid, for example, as it used to happen in the past. But now, alhamdulillah, we have a lot of books available to us and we can read and learn to a certain extent from these books. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing us to read and to learn. But most importantly, more than reading in the books, read in the universe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. Look around you in the universe and read the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses mankind at the very beginning. أَفَلَا يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبْلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ وَإِلَى السَّمَاءِ كَيْفَ رُفِعَتْ وَإِلَى الْجِبَالِ كَيْفَ نُصِبَتْ So look around you in the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put everywhere and you can read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the unwritten book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the creation that you can see around you. I hope that answers the question. Okay, we have another question um, regarding the steps the steps of idol worshipping, the intention was good to keep remembering the Kaaba, but the following steps let them slip. In our days, we have many slips. Yes. How to consolidate to our religion in a modest way? Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is a very good question, mashallah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered that question in a very conclusive and comprehensive way. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Taraktu fikum. I have left among you what, you what if you stick to, you will never go astray. And what is that? Kitab Allahi wa sunnati. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my practical application of that book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which we know as the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, again in the meaning of the hadith, مَنْ سَنَّ سُنَّةً حَسَنًا فَلَهُ أَجْرُهَا وَأَجْرُهَا مَنْ عَلَّ بِيَا إِلَيْهُمْ الْقِيَامَةً which means whoever establishes a good practice in Islam, as long as it's not an innovation or bid'ah, and inshallah next time we're going to talk about what is a bid'ah, because again, this is a word that is being abused. People use it all the time without really understanding what really is a bid'ah. Or is electricity in the masjid a bid'ah? Of course not. Are the lines in the carpet to set the line straight a bid'ah? Of course not. Is praying taraweeh in congregation a bid'ah? Of course not. So we're going to learn, inshallah, next time, what is, what is a bid'ah? So the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever establishes a good practice in Islam, like, for example, one of the companions, Sayyidina Tamib ibn Aws al-Dari, he was a trader who used to travel to Asham quite a lot. And one day he saw that in Asham they used lamps, oil lamps. Whereas in Medina they did not know these oil lamps. So he brought some oil lamps and he hung them in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Therefore, after Maghrib, people could still see the face of the Prophet ﷺ. New invention. Is this a bid'ah? Of course not. The Prophet ﷺ looked at it, approved it, and he made dua for Sayyidina Tamim radiallahu anhu. So whoever establishes a good practice in, in Islam is going to carry its its a reward and the word of everyone who follows suit until the day of judgment without diminishing their reward. And whoever establishes a bad practice, the bad bid'ah this time, with the bad inventions or the bad innovations in Islam, coming with something that is not in the origin of deen with the purpose of worship. Like, for example, someone saying, I am going to fast every day of the year, including the day of Eid that the Prophet ﷺ has prohibited us from, from doing. This would be a bid'ah because they added in Islam something that's not part of it. 
when the Prophet وسلم, told his companions about Al Hajj pilgrimage, one of them asked the question, Afi amin, ya Rasulullah? Should we do it every year, Ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet وسلم, did not respond. He kept repeating the questions. After the third time, the Prophet وسلم, said, No. If I answered yes, it would be compulsory upon you and you won't be able to do it. So do not ask too many questions. Whatever I give you, follow it. And whatever I abstain from saying, just it is allowable as long as I did not prohibit you from doing it. So that would be a way to avoid the pitfall in which Quraysh and the other Arab tribes fell into by introducing in their faith something that was not part of it. Sayyidina Ibrahim used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any intermediary or any go-between. They introduced this idea of the go-betweens or the idols. So that was a bad innovation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned in the Quran. I hope that answers the question. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. It looks like uh, we finished in perfect timing, nine o'clock on the dot. Um, just a quick announcement. Inshallah, our next class is scheduled for September the 20th. I will send an email for the October classes, inshallah. Um, and a reminder, all of the sessions are recorded and you can see them on youtube.com slash massrdu. That's also in your email. And of course, the homework um, is from the website islamicsource.org, O-R-G. Um, Dr. Ihab, would you like to assign episodes five and six? Or yes, what would you please, like? Please, let's make it a habit, inshallah. Each time we're going to watch two lectures, so maybe about 20 minutes every week or 25 minutes every week. The duration of each one of the sessions is around 20, 25 minutes. So next time, inshallah, we're going to discuss the fifth and the sixth uh, sessions and what ayat were associated with them. And remember, all of this is still before probably the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so the ayat that would address these events are ayat that are looking back at events that happened 30, 35, 40 years before, as we mentioned about Surah Al-Fil today. There's a question, Inshallah. I believe, from Sister Iman. Can we send questions during these days in, uh, till next session? Of course you can, Inshallah. I'm going to check the... Uh, the website regularly, islamicsource.org. And at the bottom, you have comments. So please, if you have any questions, send these questions. and I'll be glad to answer them, inshallah. Inshallah. There is, so there is a week that everybody has to catch up. So we're hoping everybody will take advantage of that time uh, to catch up, inshallah. And we just, we wanted to welcome um, Masjid uh, Ibad al-Rahman. I think they took a, they already signed out for Aisha but they are joining us tonight as a group. So we hope that everybody, that encourages everybody hopefully to get together in groups and uh, enjoy the classes. MashaAllah, they established a good practice if we're talking about Sunnah Hasana. This is an example of Sunnah Hasana to gather together for the sake of learning together and growing together, inshallah. So if you want to invite some of your friends or your relatives to watch together and discuss together, that would be great, inshallah. That's the purpose of these meetings, Bidlay. Okay, I think that's a wrap, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.